several uh, items like several things like the joint motions being coupled, joint motions being independent, particularly when you mount something the actuator remotely away from the joint. We had looked at this, we had also looked at teaching how using the robot as a measuring device is useful for teaching that is second thing we had looked at. So, joint motion or rather actuator coupling motion couple we had seen independent, independent and coupled we had looked at that, we had done some you know various uh, this we had seen. Also we looked at of teaching, this is what we saw in the previous lecture, most of it was perhaps devoted to this portion. So, starting from the base kinematic configurations of various manipulators, main bodies, wrists, then we looked at the grippers. So, in a sequentially we have been starting from the base of the manipulator and going upwards and looking we have come we had come up to the gripper and then we had briefly looked at teaching and actuator motions independent and now, I will just briefly touch upon manipulators, uh, some commercial manipulators and their capabilities before I go on to the next topic that will be on actuators, electric actuators is what I am going to look at as a subsequent topic. So, before I go to that, we will just briefly look at commercial manipulators. Now, I have taken this you know sort of an averaging uh, look, look, looked at the various manipulators and come out with uh, some details. Now, I am looking at manipulators particularly in the automotive industry is what I have seen and captured some details you know typical features that is what I would call features of industrial manipulator. Okay, I have chosen two because there is no end you know if you uh, go through the web you will find so many companies are there which deal with uh, manipulators that there is an enormous range of manipulators commercially available. We look at the articulated arm, this is widely used for welding, spot welding, then for painting and, uh, and we look at the SCARA which is widely used for assembly job. Now, the typical uh, reach for the articulated arm is about 2.5 meters in the automotive industry. For the scar it is about 1.2 meters. Okay. Then the payload, payload of the articulated arm is typically about 125 kg kilograms. For the scar arms, there are those which range from 10 to 50 kilogram payload. Scar arms, you know the scar arm where the cylindrical work body uh, uh, work space. Waist rotations are typically about 360 degrees in the waist rotation. Here it is about 360 degrees and here is in this car of course, the waist is the main rotating joint so typically about 120 degrees. Now, in the articulated arm there are other what you call that joints which is I mean there is the wrist there are other main body joints where rotate shoulder then uh, elbow like this there are several other joints they typically rotate about 150 degrees to 720 particularly at the wrist the 720 refers to the wrist rotation 720 degrees of rotation of the wrist mind you these are not used uh, for uh, you know doing any task it is only to orient the object. Then the in the scara typically all rotations are 120. Okay. The rotational speeds of individual joints at the at individual joints is about rotational speed speeds about 100 to 200 degrees 
per second in the case of the articulating hundred to go in the degrees per second which is a fairly <coughs> fast as you go back and in the case of the scara usually it is the tip speed which is given here you will have correspondingly the tip speed scara is used for assembly as i told you about 2 meters per second as assembly it's a very fast you know because there's a lot of idle time in assembly when you fetch the part to do the task of assembly you know you don't want to lose time over that repeatability in uh, the large manipulators obviously you know something tells you it now it need not be as much as in smaller ones 0.4 mm in the case of the articulated in the case of the scara it goes down to 3 to 0.05 mm fairly highly accurate because you are going to use it for assembly you know we had that remote center compliance which we saw last time that along with the scara you to very good capability for assembly but then the positional repeatability is very high as you can see now the weight of this robot system is about 1600 kilos compare it with the payload 125 kg 1600 kg is the weight and here it is about 3200 kg much lighter because you are not lifting weights in the case of the scara so the whole arm could be much lighter okay except the end effect the rest of the time you are not lifting weight so the whole arm these are the typical features of industrial manipulators if you go through the web you will find lot more information on this i have taken the two popular manipulators which are heavily used in industry okay so this is just a uh, point piece of information to you now having looked at this let us now move on to the various uh, drives there are several drives in manipulators hydraulic pneumatic dc servos also ac servos but for long the most common drive has been the dc servo so we look at that then we will briefly examine stepper many manipulators use stepper particularly those which handle uh, laboratory task those which do laboratory task like you know shifting blood samples from one place to another and all nowadays there is so many diseases you don't want it to be communicated to the human so you use these little robots to shift the various samples around so many a time they use uh, stepper motors there so we'll have a look at those also but we'll begin with the dc servo because that is the most common we'll see how one selects a dc servo this is a fairly important one as you go along you will be reading about servo control and so many other aspects so it's better to have a little bit of a knowledge of how one selects the dc servo so we'll use the dc servo as the uh, i mean uh, one which we will tell you the rest of course we'll run through the principles are similar whether it's a dc servo ac servo or whatever okay let's briefly look at the dc servo motor you know one of the biggest uh, the availability of rare earth magnets have made them very compact and very light that's one of the big thing the servo motor electric servo motor with the arrival of the rare earth magnets which give you a lot of magnetic uh, Field sent, field sent for a small size. Uh, these motors have become very compact over the years. We, as we looked at over the past 25 years, reduced to more, more or less less than half the size which one started with. Come down. Okay. So they use what are known as permanent magnets and permanent rare earth. magnet so usually these are called pm permanent magnet motor 
DC permanent magnet servo motor PM. The word PM is used, so it is better you know that. In the conventional DC motors, you have a stator and a rotor, that is all something you know. Stator is wound okay, and the rotor is also a wound coil in the conventional DC motor. When they shifted over to uh, many motors now for sake of uh, conserving energy, particularly the smaller motors, you have a permanent magnet field in the stator and the rotor is a wound rotor. So, as you know in any DC motor you have a commutator along with the rotor. So, you have the conventional the conventional motor has a commutator stator as P magnet. The stator uh, contains the magnet and the rotor wound commutator. Now, the commutator is a brush, there are brushes. Any one of you, any those of you who have opened a small DC motor, you have seen the commutator and the brushes. Those brushes, you know, there 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 is sparking which leads to noise which disturbs the electronics around. Apart from that friction, loss of contact, several problems and wear and tear, you have to replace the brushes after some time, all these problems exist. So, people came out when they came out with the so called brushless motors. Here what they did was the magnets are in the rotor and the coil in the stator or the stator is a wound stator that is what we do. And the commutator's function is now you know transferred to the stator where an electronic circuit electronic circuit. We you will see this uh, those of you are familiar with this electronic circuit. Electronic circuit switches the magnetic field and rotates it through appropriate switches. Okay. Shift the magnetic field through appropriate switches and it synchronizes it with the rotor motion through what are known as the rotor motion is sensed. The rotor motion is sensed so that you know you do the proper switching that is sensed through what are known as Hall effect sensor. Sense. So, this is a fairly more involved uh, design than the simple commutator brushes that is the mechanical commutation here is electronic sense and by through Hall effect sensor. Now, these have become quite popular because they they promise you more reliable operation over a period of time they are more expensive this is the scenario as regard as regards the dc servo motors current scenario now you have ac servo motors you have you know day by day there are new technologies which are emerging but some of the what we are, i am going to discuss further the principles will be similar whether you are talking of DC servos or AC servos or some of the things. Let us look at some of the performance characteristics of these DC servos. If I plot the load torque versus speed, angular velocity, that is all I mean, in angular, RPS. There is a no load speed somewhere here and there is a stall torque somewhere here in between is the straight line. This is stall, this point and this is no load. So, no load speed and a stall speed at any given voltage, there is a specific voltage you have applied to drive the Okay. That means, if you heavily load the motor at some point speed is going to be zero. 
Now, if you look at the current, again if I have the load torque and the current. you have a straight line relationship. Okay. Okay. There is a no load current you know. Here also some current is drawn at no load because you have to overcome the friction and other loss of it. It is not at 0 as you know. Now, the current I is equal to the torque divided by k t, okay, where k t is a constant and k t is given by the slope of this straight line. Okay. Now, this is how basic uh, this thing, I will show one or two more before I go to the substitute. As you change the voltage, the speed load torque curve shifts parallel to the original curve which I have drawn. So, supposing you have torque here and speed here. Now, let us say is 1, if I have one particular torque and one particular, this is the salt torque for a given voltage. Now, if I go to point 0.5 V, I will find that something like that. Okay. Now, if I have point 0.5 of S as the salt torque, I will find point 0.5 If this is 0 0.5, so let us say this is 1 and this is 0 0.5, here also if this is 0 and 1, this will be 0 0.5. That so, this line will be high. This is how the behavior is. Okay. That means, if you reduce the speed operating point here from here to here and operate here, you will get half, everything will be half. Like that, it goes on. What about the power consumed by the motor? Let us have a look at that. If you have a load torque, then the power consumed is something like this. This is the output power, output power. It peaks at the midpoint approximately, this is the salt torque, this point is the salt torque point. So, well, I, I should say, I should not have used the word power consumed, the correct, because power consumed will depend on the efficiency and from here you can work out the power consumed. Now, if you look at the efficiency, you will get a curve like this. Again, what is load torque? This is the salt. Peak efficiency is somewhere here, roughly about 0.35. The salt torque. Now, these are data which I have culled from various sources. Approximately, this how the system behaves. Peak efficiency depends on individual motors, so you can go up to about 90, 90 plus, 90 plus percentage, which is possible. <coughs> okay. So, this is in general is the behavior of the servo motor, all right, DC servo. Now, let us see how we could, uh, what are the applications typically 
and how are you going to select a motor given an application. One application is continuous operation. You are driving something, some load at a particular speed over a period of time, then maybe after some time you change the speed in order to meet your manufacturing requirements. You are not continuously changing the speed. What you are doing is operating at a specific speed over a long period of time. That is what is known as continuous operation. Okay. Now, in continuous operation, I think all of you know how to uh, sort of rate the motor. What you look at is the load torque, you know the load speed, the torque into speed gives you the power. You have to check whether the motor will supply that particular torque. You have to check whether the amplifier or the electronic circuit will be able to carry the requisite current. Right? you have to make sure that the requisite voltage is available in order to run the motor and lastly you have to make sure the motor does not heat up within that particular time. You have to make sure the motor does not heat up during that particular time. Now, these are fairly straightforward. Once the motor starts it keeps running at the same speed and the heating it is very easy to predict how the system will behave beforehand and there are several semi empirical formula available from the manufacturers themselves who will tell you this is the way the heating will occur if you want to operate it continuously. They give the curves so that you can choose the motor. All this is possible as far as continuous operation is concerned. It is a fairly straightforward way of selecting. If you, but what we have here is what are what is known as intermittent operation. Okay, or more appropriately it is called <coughs> intermittent motion. This is a more correct word intermittent motion. So, this continuous operation is called continuous duty. So, we have two things. Continuous duty I think I am adding too many u's here. Okay. U. Okay. Continuous duty and the second one is called intermittent motion. Okay, intermittent. I show you a typical intermittent motion curve, and we will see what. I mean by intermittent motion. In a robot joint, you would move the arm through maybe 50 degrees weight and then again move through another 50 degrees, this is one way or 20 degrees, whatever it is, right. Or you may move through 50 degrees weight and return also, okay. So, these are the various uh, uh, intermittent motions. So, you in a lathe, NC lathe, you have these various motions. Let us look at the intermittent motion and determine how we are going to select the motor for intermittent motion. So, I will show you a typical curve, this is sin versus <laughs> angular velocity. the sort of motion one desire. The arm has accelerated to a particular velocity, maintained a constant velocity. So, I start it 0, I will call this A, B, C, and I will call this B, goes on. You see, a particular lever has accelerated attained a specific velocity, maintained a uniform velocity from A to B, decelerate from B to C, 0 velocity, 0 acceleration from C to D, it waits, then again continues. This is one cycle. Now, this cycle has been given to you. This is one cycle of motion. 
and timings are given or you have chosen as a designer you have chosen this timing p1 i will call this p2 then this is p3 that is the period of acceleration to go from 0 to a is called is p1 the period required for the period utilized for constant velocity a to b is p2 then deceleration from b to c is p3 and then there is the dwell time or the pause p4 because you know it's waiting for a long time typically the whole cycle may be 1 second or 2 seconds and giving this to your okay so we have 0 to a acceleration in time t1 acceleration we have then o to a then a to b this is in time t2 we have uniform velocity angular velocity okay so zero acceleration obviously right because uniform velocity so this will be zero acceleration then b to c we have in a time t3 deceleration and c to d this is for a period t4 time t4 period t4 we have a dwell wherein velocity is zero acceleration is zero this is the cycle now it's no longer a continuous uh, you know operation continuous duty it's a sort of a cyclic theory. how are we going to select the motor we know the motor performance characteristics and all we have the catalog data how are we going to select the motor now remember every motor this is one cycle no? this is one this also you should know. let us remember every motor drives some load or other we will in this uh, case we will uh, typically the first problem you encounter is you know an arm is going like this some speed is given right at which is rotating and then you go and look at the motor the motor is running at about 3000 rpm whereas you know this is not so fast now what is the speed reducer you have to use one and what should be the reduction ratio you should use should I choose a motor of 3000 3, rpm and what size is size of gear, reduction of gearbox 10 or 15 or should I use a motor of 5000 rpm should I you know so these are questions which have to be answered by you first you have to choose the gearbox because when you are driving a load with a the gearbox also contributes to the motor's load so you should know what is the moment of inertia of all that and the efficiency of the gearbox so you have to choose the gearbox now secondly the load driven is not being driven at a continuous operation then it is very easy for you to work out all these things the whole thing is fluctuating velocity is changing from instant to instant supposing you choose a specific gearbox will you be able to meet the lowest as well as the or the highest velocity of the so these are the questions which one has to answer now there are no specific answers which one can give it's a, it's a question of experience. So, there are some guidelines which have been provided both by the manufacturer as well as other engineers who have experience in this. Case. One choice of uh, gearbox is like this how to choose the gearbox or any reduction for that matter, whether it is a gearbox, because you know sometimes what do you do? You drive like in a NC machine, you like to drive the carriage there is a motor then there is a screw so there is a reduction through the screw so whether it is a gearbox or any reduction I should say choosing gearbox slash any reduction or increase mostly you reduce this so what you do is you look at the maximum speed of load multiply that by 2 multiply that by 2 this is the first step you are going to do is choose this gearbox 
Now, maximum allowable speed of motor, every motor has a speed, the manufacturer will tell you do not exceed this speed. He will say under no circumstances, continuous operation, he will say do not exceed this speed, then do not continuous operation. That will be G, where G is the is the reduction ratio, I will call it omega load divided by omega m. G is the ratio. Okay. Omega load divided by omega m. That means, if the load is rotating at a lower r p m than the motor, G will be less than 1 or if the load is rotating at a lower r p m than the motor, g will be less than 1. Notice that this is also equal to alpha l, the angular acceleration of the load versus by motor, these two are equal. So, this is the reduction ratio, I will not use the word gear ratio, I will call it the reduction ratio here after or I should not call it rear reduction ratio, transmission ratio, that is the more correct word. So, this is the transmission ratio. Because you know, gearbox is a particular instant of a transmission system, right? So, I can use screws and all that. So, what we, we generally recommended is maximum speed of load into 2 is equal to maximum allowable speed of motor into g. What does it mean imply? That means, let us say the maximum allowable speed of the motor is 3000 rpm and g is selected as 10 what is it, I am sorry, as a point 0.1, that means a reduction of point 0.1. So, your load is rotating at about 300 r. So, your maximum allowable speed of motor into g, let us say this is 3000 and this is point 0.1. Okay. Maximum speed of load into 2 is equal to this much. So, this comes to equal to about 300. So, what is the maximum speed of load? 150. So, if you know the maximum speed of load, this is the first selection of gearbox, because you know many a time you may have to go back and revise the whole thing. As at this point of time you do not even know the torque being transmitted and all that, you, know. you have to. Now, why do they do this? Because if you have noticed the performance of the motor as the speed increases, the torque available to you drops. Okay. So, you are positioning it somewhere here in this mid range, somewhere in this range operation, and you are taking it half the speed. maximum allowable speed of motor, essentially it is equivalent to dividing maximum allowable speed of motor by 2. So, you are positioning it somewhere, that is for a start. This, okay, so, since this is because torque, mind you this is a guideline, Okay. So, you may say I will control the voltage, this 3000 takes into account all those voltage controls and the maximum peak voltage will be there for every motor, you cannot cross that, you, there will be a specific voltage you can allowable voltage which the manufacturer will use. You cannot say that you know I will keep on pushing the voltage up and attain more speeds and all, this is the standard procedure for guideline for selecting. Now, you have to compute the inertia s. You have the motor inertia then you have I L the load inertia. Find it is. Now at this point of time, you do not know the motor inertia, you have not yet selected the motor, 
but you know the load inertia because you know what you are going to drive. Okay. Now, what is the torque required to drive this load inertia? During the acceleration phase, you have this torque to be provided by motor to drive I L is I L into alpha L into G. The angular acceleration multiplied by the moment inertia multiplied by the gear ratio. Okay, gear ratio you have to multiply. That's what the torque. So to be remember that the transmission ratio has to be utilized. Remember G is equal to omega L by omega. Okay, now this translates into G into alpha m into G from this formula. Here I have written it at top. Alpha L equal to alpha m into G. I substitute and I get this. So square of the ratio, transmission ratio comes into the picture. In order to drive both the motor and the now, this is only to drive the load. Now, you have to also the drive motor the itself has got its own rotor. So, total net torque is that will be I m alpha m plus this g square I l. Okay? This is a net torque. Now, do you know I m at this stage? No. Again, what many propose is, do you know I am at this stage? You got it? You have to drive the motor also, its own rotor has to accelerate. Now, the effective inertia so turns out to be I am plus G square. Sometimes they divide it by the efficiency, we will omit it for the moment. I plus g squared by I L divided by the g squared the gearbox efficiency is divided sometimes, but we will omit it for the moment. This is the effective inertia. One thumb rule is when you look at the motor at this stage, you know you know certain things about your load and motor and the torque and all that, but you do not know I am just like you made some guideline for selecting g as keep it at half the motors uh, safe speed similarly some guideline one guideline which is used is in the first instance let i m be equal to g squared i m let i m be equal to g squared i m okay now remember why motor inertia should be brought down if you reduce the speed g squared keeps dropping supposing you know from 3000 rpm i reduce it to 100 rpm what is g equal to 100 by 3000 g squared will pull down this value so the motor's inertia seems to be the larger one depends of course very heavy motor or very heavy load and then of course, this will be predominant, but otherwise this is divided by the square of the speed uh, reduces like this. So, you know this is going to come down and this is going to look large. So, choosing the right motor inertia is also important, it is not just you know worry about this and forget about this. Okay? Got it? So, as a thumb rule or as a first in the first uh, this say first selection first cut choose I m equal to I do not want to write it because it is not a formula choose I m equal to because you will go to the motor catalog you know some of these torques required you look up there you know the speed required you look for the motor and then if he gives that see that also if you have a range of motors some of them having their motor inertia is given then a thumb rule to choose the motor is look for I m which is close to Okay. So, this is what we have come up to this point. Now, let us go ahead. Now, the real calculation begins here. 
Now, so what do we have now? Let us look at the review the situation. We have time here, we have the angular velocity here and the curve. Now, mind you, I have chosen this acceleration as a straight line, deceleration, I mean this acceleration period, the velocity change as a straight line here also, constant acceleration. It need not be. As you go along, you will find that there are several other choices for these velocity variations. Here, I have chosen it as a straight line, so that I have a constant angular axis. This will translate into a torque like this. A constant torque to be applied to accelerate the load, followed by another torque, constant torque to overcome the friction during this constant velocity period. There will be frictional losses, so many losses, so that is a constant torque. Then there is a for the deceleration period, constant torque but in the negative, and then no torque. So, this is our D. This is C, this is B, A is the torque, and timings are T1, T2, T3, T4. Now this is just a pictorial representation of what I require, a torque to accelerate. Notice one thing, in this period, the friction torque, here this torque is a sum of the torque required to accelerate the mass as well as to overcome the friction. Okay. Here you are only overcoming friction because the mass is moving at a particular uniform velocity. Here you are decelerating, friction is going to aid you, so that is why this difference, you see this. Okay. So, keep that in mind as we go to the next step. O to A, the time is T 1, what is the angular acceleration? Here you have omega A as the angular velocity, let us call that omega a and here it is 0. So, the angular acceleration is omega a minus 0 divided by t 1 that is equal to, we will call it alpha 1. So, what is the torque required? T 1, we will call it capital T 1 torque equal to motor inertia plus d squared i l load inertia into alpha 1 plus friction torque due to friction into g. Because you know the load has some friction that also has to be multiplied by g. Is it ok? d squared i suffix l, sorry I wrote it as i l, it should be suffix l, not this, suffix l, i suffix l. This is the torque you require. Now, you have to divide it by the efficiencies also. See, this torque through the gearbox it is going, so you will have an efficiency here, divided by. This torque also is going through the gearbox motor through the gearbox is seeing this torque. So, there will be a gearbox loss efficient that also I have to bring in. Okay. So, in this zone you have the acceleration the torque required to accelerate the body plus whatever is the torque. Now, for A to B where there is a uniform velocity we have seen that the time is T 2 angular acceleration is 0, because of constant velocity, constant or uniform velocity. So, torque 
during this period to be pro provided by motor is equal to C F frictional torque. Okay. Okay. This is during the second period. Now, let us see what happens in the third period T 3 during the period T 3 this is from B to C period is T 3 angular acceleration again you know I have taken a very simple example omega B minus 0 by T 3 equal to alpha 3 because you know whatever is the angular velocity here here it comes to 0 I take just slope of this curve as angular acceleration constant easier just for illustration. Now, what is the torque demanded here equal to again we can write I m plus now I am incorporating the epsilon t here I l into alpha 3 minus because you have to subtract the friction torque since friction is aiding this friction minus since friction aids since friction is aiding deceleration I have to subtract that it is stopping the machine okay. ok. If you have any doubt just ask me I think it is reasonably clear. Now, I am only calculating the torque, I am just calculating the magnitudes of the various torques. No, no. See, you are speeding up, no, that is ok, but I am only cal cal calculating the torque, you know. I am only calculating magnitude, I should have said that this is the magnitude, I am not worried about the magnitude. There is an acceleration or deceleration force is equal to mass in the same thing I am using that I am just using the torque equal to force equal to mass into acceleration whether decelerating or accelerating I am only calculating the magnitude so I am not looking at the no 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 which one yeah see when there is a friction torque here the motor is there is a gear motor, a gearbox and a load. Okay. There is a friction torque in the load. If there is friction in the load and you have a reducer, what about the motor? Motor has to supply lesser uh, torque, right? You are the load is rotating at 100 rpm and there is a friction torque T there, right? The gearbox is reducing the speed from 300, 3000 to 100. What is the gear reduction? 3000 to 100 is 30 any torque on the output what is the torque on the input side it is much less right no, this part is coming here no huh. Yeah, I am looking at everything this ok. Now, this alpha 3 is the motors uh, 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 this is the motors acceleration I am multiplying it by the motors acceleration the inertia as seen by the motor multiplied by the motor acceleration. Yeah. See this is the inertia as seen by the motor alpha 3 is the motor see uh, ok maybe this is the angular acceleration of the motor I should write it clearly here the angular acceleration not the load the angular acceleration of motor ok angular acceleration of motor yeah if you have a very efficient system yeah. if you have a very no gearbox losses I have taken care of here here load and the gearbox losses are taken care of by this again Okay. So, acceleration of motor sorry I, I think I should have mentioned this here this this applies everywhere 0 to A also remember 
I have not shown it. Zero T also, this is the angular acceleration of motor. Alpha one is the angular acceleration of motor. Okay, that should be clear. I am very sorry, I didn't mention. Now what we do is, so for each period we have calculated torques. We have a torque capital T one for period one, a torque capital T two for period T two, a torque capital T three for period T three. That is deceleration period. Of course, there is no torque here. Calculate the RMS, T RMS. This is what is calculated. We now calculate what is known as T R M S, which turns out to be the square root of T one squared into the time T one, all magnitude T two squared into the time T two. Torques are all magnitude, okay? T three squared into the time T three plus zero. That is for the period T four into T four, whole divided by T one. Plus, these are the timings added up. Cycle time it will come to is the cycle time. In each of those segments, calculate the torque. Square them, multiply by the time, sum them up. This gives you the TR. Okay. So now you have got in each period the torque. You have got the RMS torque. Now you have to ultimately select the motor. So you can now select the motor like this. Go to the catalog, manufacturer's catalog, and you will find he will give you torque, then speed, then he will say this is the area of continuous operation. And he will say, "Do not cross this boundary, outer boundary. Do not cross. Do not operate beyond this." He will give that, and this will be the this portion. Here it will be intermittent operation. I don't know. I'm mean, putting too many M's and too many things. You know, when writing it becomes so. Please uh, don't worry about the spelling mistake. Okay, too many things I'm adding. Sometimes double because from here you can't see what you are writing. So many a time you tend to add or subtract. So you have these. He he divides it and gives this. Go there and see. Let the RMS be positioned somewhere in this. Okay, somewhere in the continuous operation zone. Okay, now look at the four timings. You calculate what is known as T peak, maximum mag of. I'm talking of magnitude. Look at these magnitudes: T one, T two, T three, T four. Take the max of these. Okay, that will be the T peak. You have four zones. T four, of course, is zero. T one, T two, T three, right? Including the friction and all that. Pick up the maximum. That can lie in the intermittent. Okay. Now, any motor when run continuously up to some current level, the motor can. Sustain. It will heat up, but it can operate continuously because there are also cooling devices, so an equilibrium is reached and all. But some, once in a while, you can allow it to be overloaded with the current being pushed up. So you are taking care of both. Okay. If you go beyond this, magnets may degaussing of magnets may occur or overheating of the motor. All these problems are likely to. So that's why they say this is how you select the motor. Now once you have selected, then you know the exact value of I of the motor. 
go back. Okay? You know the exact value of the I of the motor then at this time. Now, if it is far away from what you have chosen, redo the calculation. Now, you know I am. This is design. You know, most designs are always like this. You start with some choice, go work the whole thing out, and then you know something. Okay? So, one of these RMS values should be here, and the other could lie here. It will also come back here. That's all. There are a lot of guidelines given by the motor manufacturers themselves, particularly with regard to temperature. You know, the ambient temperature matters a lot in incremental motion applications because due to the ambient temperature, the motor, if it's very hot ambient, then the motor selection. Now there are elaborate rules and uh, guidelines for this, and they, they also give charts. You can actually work out the temperature also. Those formula, I'm not. Those uh, procedures, I'm not telling you because. You know, there is no end at all. We keep on. Okay. Now that uh, I think uh, you know, we have come up to this. In the next class, I will go ahead and tell you how to select the various uh, amplifiers.